2 uh, Corinthians 12, my mom told me to take typing. I went, Mom, that's for girls. And she said, Preacher Golf types all his sermons out. So I took typing, and I am very thankful. I think I can do 50 to 60 words a minute. I think I can. Without looking at the keys. Look at the copy. I was taught, I was taught, I don't know how they teach them now, but I was taught on these electric typewriters, and you look at your copy, and you don't look at your hand. And so when I am copying something, like from a book I've been reading or something like that, and I'm copying something and typing it in, my mind takes every word, and I don't type in a word and try to think of the word all at once. I think of every individual letter. Boom, 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 boom. Don't make me do that sound effect again, because that's not really how it sounds. But I break it down in individual letters and then hit the key without, without looking at it. So I, I don't know how they teach now, but that's, that's how I was instructed. So, um, Rome, I want to look at, we're going to uh, do a couple things. Uh, we're going to finish up 2 Corinthians 12, um, maybe today. But I want to look at one more thing concerning grace, because that's what uh, we had started out on in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. And so we were looking at what the definition of grace is. Romans 4 has, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best uh, definitions of grace. Um, and it involves Abraham and those who are of the seed of Abraham by faith. We are, we are the seed. We're counted of the seed of Abraham by, by faith through grace, not of birth and not of works. Abraham received the righteousness of God imputed to him not by what he did, and not, definitely not by keeping the law, because there was no law to keep. There was no uh, instructions from Mount Sinai given to Abraham. That was given uh, 430 years later, but not, uh, not in the day of Abraham. So how did then Israel receive any grace at all? It was because they were the children of promise, by birth, how can we receive anything from God? We are the children of promise by faith. We've been adopted in, grafted in, is how the Bible puts it. So Romans 4, verse 4, is, in my, in my opinion, there may be others who would say, I think, you know, this place over here looks better. But Romans 4 seems to me, then, the best definition of what grace is. In verse 4 of Romans 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So there is a clear distinction in the Bible between grace and works. If you choose works, let me know how that works. Because nobody, and I mean nobody in history, with the exception of Christ, has ever attained the righteousness of the law by works. No one has, only Christ. So to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Underline that part, justifieth the ungodly. Because that's what God does. He does it to those and you put yourself in the category of ungodly because that's how we act sometimes. Verse 6, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Where is that from? Does anybody know? Where is he quoting from? Give you two dollars and twelve cents if you can tell me what psalm that comes from. This you ought to know this. This is you ought to memorize this. You ought to memorize at least part of 
Psalm, are you ready? 32. Now, somebody hand up $2.12. Because I got it right. Psalm 32. I looked at this years ago, and when I really first started counting things in the Bible, I started seeing rhythms in the Bible. And um, I noticed that there was four things that, that David said here. And then I heard Mike Hutzel preach a message on it uh, down in Florida. And it just, I mean, it rolled over my soul. And I shared with him, I said, I like what you said. Let me show you, let me show you what I see in here. And he enjoyed it. Um, by the way, I'm going to go ahead and announce now, Brother Mike Hutzel has, uh, I, I can go ahead and tell this, he has taken uh, the Oak Lane Church in Harrison, Arkansas. Pastor Lonnie Burks has retired from uh, full-time pastoring. He's still, you, there's no successfully retired minister. Uh, once you're in the ministry, you're there for life. And you're always going to be preaching somewhere. But uh, Brother Lonnie has retired from full-time pastoring. He is uh, doing revivals and camp meetings all over the place. Um, so they have been on a search now since June of last year for a pastor. And they were trying to get one. All, uh, they were trying. Uh, Lonnie gave them till December to find one. And they couldn't find one. And so uh, they had been in contact with Pastor Hutzel, and he finally, uh, they worked out a, a deal where he can still continue part of his ministry on the road and in Kenya. And uh, by the way, pray for Kenya. Um, there was a helicopter crash earlier in Turkana, and it killed four Americans. And by their names, I could tell they were young men, and I'm assuming they were missionaries or some sort of aid organization somehow, some way, uh, helicopter crash. And uh, then a, um, a brand new plane just put into commission in November, left Ethiopia yesterday, headed for Nairobi, crashed 18 minutes after takeoff, killed all of them on board, 100 some odd people. And uh, so it gets a little scary sometimes think about going back over there. But uh, anyway, just remember them in your prayers. But pray for Brother Mike and his new ministry at Oak Lane. He's going to be here this next Sunday and he's going to fulfill his obligation here. And then he at the Sunday after that, he's going to be back at Oak Lane. So pray for him. Pray for the Oak Lane Church. They're our good friends. We love them. And uh, so lift them up. Uh, but anyway, um, Psalm 32 in the first two verses, there's four things that David says here. Think about that number and what it means. It points you to the gospel. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. That's the first thing. Number two, whose sin is covered. Your sin is not just forgotten about. It is covered. What's it covered with? The blood of Christ. Like the white blood cells, how white blood cells in your body, when they find an uncleanness, D, your white blood cells will locate the uncleanness, cover it completely, completely. If it needs more white blood cells, the white blood cells will show up. Your body will produce more and more and more. And what happens is it, it does not leave any of the uncleanness uncovered. Just like Christ, if somebody tells you that Christ died for part of your sins, they're lying through their teeth. They have not read the Bible. They made that up or they got it from someplace else. They got it from the Internet, wherever they got it from. But the white blood cells will cover every single speck of uncleanness in your body, period. It will not stop until it does that. And so it'll cover the uncleanness. And depending on the amount of uncleanness, you might have to, you might have some sort of showing of white blood cells. That's what, forgive the word, but that's what pus is. It's accumulation of protein and white blood cells. And that's because your body did what your body's supposed to do. That found something unclean or an infection there and went to work on it. And if it was a major uncleanness, then there's going to be a major expulsion of that. 
We don't like to talk about that, but that's how God designed our bodies to get rid of. And he's showing he's showing Christ in that. So when he says your transgression is your sin is covered, he means it's completely covered all the way. Uh, verse two, blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. In other words, you are guilty before God. But when you stand before God in judgment, when they open the book of the deeds that you have done, everything is written down. Everything is. How can God do that? Well, he has an unlimited amount of angels. So I'm sure there's an angel. And this would be good for you to think about. Trust me. An angel following you around with a book. Sometimes he's got to write fast to keep up with you. Huh? Shorthand. shorthand. Now God's hand is not short. He's writing it down. Everything you do, an angel writes it down. Follows you around to write it down. But then the blood of Jesus covers that. And so it cannot be imputed to you because it's not there. The phrase of the idea of justification means that, and we use this phrase, just as if I had never sinned. And that's the idea, is that once the sins have been completely covered, when the book is opened, uh, he cannot find a thing, then will my heart be glad, while tears of joy will flow, because I came and settled, I settled long ago. So I'm in that mood today. Whatever mood that is, I, that's what I'm in. So that's what happens. The, it, the imputation of righteousness to the sinner is one of the key doctrines that we believe in. It's what separates us from every other false doctrine, every other cult, every other religion in the world, is that we believe in the absolute total imputation of righteousness and the Lord will not impute iniquity against us. Cannot, because it doesn't exist. It's not there. And then the fourth blessing is, Blessed is the man in whom there, in whom, whose spirit there is no guile. Your spirit, now your flesh. He did not say your flesh has no guile. That's not what it says. Your flesh is full of guile. It is full of wickedness. It is full of unrighteousness. It is full of lies. It's full of cover-ups. Your flesh wants to cover up your sin. That won't work. It won't cut it. So when God looks in your spirit, your spirit has no guile because your spirit says, I'm not hiding this from God. I'm not going to keep this from God. I'm going to go to God and I'm going to tell God what I did. I'm going to apologize. I'm going to have God pardon my transgressions. I'm going to have God forgive my sins and pardon my iniquity. So there's no guile in your spirit. You're not going to lie to God. You're not going to hold back from God. You're going to tell God everything that you did. So there's four things in those two verses. And then he said in verse 5, I acknowledge my sin unto thee. And mine iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sins. Four more things. In that one verse, I acknowledge my sin, my iniquity have I not hid, I will confess my transgressions, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sins. Notice the first three, I acknowledged, I did not hide, I confessed, are you. The fourth thing is always the thing that's different in the Bible. In the Bible, and even in this world, if you find four things, three of them are the same, one of them is different. The fourth thing here is what God does. God forgives the iniquity of of your sin. So he says in verse 6. For this shall everyone that is godly. Pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters. They shall not come nigh unto him. So back in Romans chapter 4. Turn back there. It won't hurt you. It won't bite you. Do it. Romans 4. Verse 9. Come at this blessedness. Then upon the circumcision only, 
or upon the uncircumcision? Is it just upon the Jews who have kept part of the law? No. It comes upon, for we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. It was granted to Abraham before he was circumcised, not after. Um, I don't know, I don't remember offhand. I want to say Genesis 17, maybe. maybe no, maybe wrong on that. When Abraham was circumcised, when he circumcised, when he was circumcised, Ishmael was 13, because he circumcised Ishmael 13 years after he was born, and he circumcised Isaac eight days after he was born. So I'm going to say somewhere around Genesis 20, maybe. 21, something like that. Um, anyway, not too long, it was not, I can't, I can't remember what chapter. Anyway, chapter Genesis 12 is when God gives the promise to Abraham. So it was some time after that, that God gave Oh, here it is in, yeah, it's chapter 17. That was right the first time. If you look in verse 23 of Genesis 17, Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all that were born in his house and all that were bought with his, uh, his money and every male among the men of Abraham's house and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day as God had said unto him. So, Genesis uh, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16... God has given Abraham multiple blessings, multiple promises, and he gave that to him before the token of circumcision. Circumcision was only the outward sign, just like water baptism. It's only the outward sign of what God has already accomplished on the inside. So how can circumcision save us? Or how can baptism save us when baptism is all external? So is circumcision. It's only an outward showing of what God has already done on the inside. Should we do it? Should we get baptized? Absolutely. But I know some people in the Bible that are in heaven that were never water baptized. And I believe they're in heaven anyway. So uh, look at verse, where that Romans chapter 4 again. Verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being on in an uncircumcision. I'm not, I'm mixing my verses up. Verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. He had the faith first. Then the visible signs. Look at... Um, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, turn there, Ephesians chapter 1, let's look in verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Here's the order. The order of how it works. The word of God begins. The word of God goes out. 
goes out of the mouth of a preacher. It goes out of the mouth of someone reading the word of God. It goes out of those who wrote the word of God. But the word of God is always at the, the first of everything. If God doesn't speak, nothing happens. If God doesn't say it. If God doesn't say, let there be light, then there's no light. If God doesn't say, um, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters to divide the waters. If God doesn't say, let us make man in our image after our likeness. In other words, if God doesn't speak, nothing can happen. And I marvel at the number of people who say, oh, we had so-and-so saved or so many hundreds of people got saved. Well, was the gospel preached? No, but we did a lot of singing. That's not the gospel. That's not the word of God. Um, and I'm just one of these. If you're saved, you're saved by the gospel. You're saved by the word of God. Or are you really saved? If it's not the word of God that did it, even Peter said, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So in the way I see it, it's always initiated by the word of God. And if keeping that in mind, whose idea was it first for you to be saved? Yours or God's? It was God's. When the night that I was saved, it was a, I believe it was a Monday night or maybe a Tuesday night. It was early on in the week. It was at Bible camp. The preacher preached the gospel from a King James Bible. And I responded to that. Prior to that service, I was a nine-year-old boy. I was not thinking anything about how I needed to give my heart to Jesus. That was not here. It wasn't until after the word was preached. I don't remember the sermon. I don't remember the words. But I remember it was after the word of God was preached. And from what I can see, that's how it's done. And that's how it's done every single time. And I've run into people, I've talked to people who say that... I've heard sermons where not a word of the gospel was preached. By the way, I went to a funeral yesterday. Uh, sister um, Helen Mangan's sister passed away, and the funeral was yesterday. And I went up and shook the preacher's hand. He was an older fella, and I'm glad of that because he actually preached the gospel. And I went and shook his hand, and I said, thank you for doing that. I really appreciate that. There, there was hardly anybody going to the preacher shaking his hand afterward. I noticed that. They were all visiting with the family and so on, you know, as they go by the casket. And he's standing there at that casket all alone. And I made it a point to go there and said, thank you for preaching the gospel. Whether anybody responds, that's God's business. But at least the word went forth. And I was appreciative of it. Uh, but anyway... Um, I've heard messages preached where not, not a word of scripture was given out. And, I, I, and people, you can get people, we can get people down to the altar with an emotional response to our words and to our services. But if they are not hearing the word of God, if the seed of the word of God is not going in their heart, is it really being born again? Is it really? And so the order that he gives here in Ephesians is that the word of truth is spoken and then it must be believed. If it's not believed, then what's the point? Then it's believed, and then salvation comes in the way of, or in the form of, they are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Just like you seal a letter when you lick the envelope, or in old days they used to melt wax and put a, a seal on there, whatever, to, to seal that, to make sure that, that what's inside stays inside. And that to me is, is the real beauty of salvation. And that to me is what it looks like. Um, back again in Romans 4. Let's pick it up in verse 13. For the promise 
that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. In other words, if God didn't give any salvation uh, until the law was given, waiting for people to keep the law, then everything that God said to Abraham is null and void. Verse 15, because the law worketh wrath. Remember that. The point of the law is to show mankind the wrath of God because that's what the law does. It shows you what's going to happen. We have laws in this country, but if those laws are not enforced, then those laws are in vain. Those laws are a joke. If those laws, if we do not have police enforcement, law enforcement people out enforcing the laws against mankind, uh, what, boy, I tell you what, I'm just rolling over this Michael Jackson deal because he is a, he's a pedophile, pervert, child molester, vicious one, and um, he is getting what he deserves. Okay? He is getting what he deserves. God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. So the law worketh wrath. Verse uh, 15, for where no law is, there is no transgression. So there has to be a law. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. And to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that, which, that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So if you believe what God said, and I mean believe it. And I don't really see a whole lot of levels of belief. You either believe it or you don't. I don't believe in Santa Claus. And there's nothing in me that believes in Santa Claus. It's not a level of I don't believe in Santa Claus. It's just that I don't believe in Santa Claus, period, the end. But I do believe in God and His Son, Jesus Christ, and I believe in what God said. So very quickly, uh, to finish this out, uh, verse, uh, let's see here, the father, verse 17, as it is written, I've made thee a father of many nations before whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. God is able to take nothing, which is who we are, and make something out of us, which is what we are in Christ. Verse 18, who against hope, believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which is spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. When he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. If God, God does not break promises like we do. If God said it, he is able to do it. And if God is not able to do it, he would not have said it. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness now it is not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also. That is the joining together of the Old and the New Testaments to make one complete word of God. It was not just written for Abraham only. It was written for us in this time and in these days. So when it comes to reading your Bible... Take your pick or let God pick out what part of the Bible you're going to read. Read the Old Testament, read the New Testament, read some more of the Old, read some more of the New. It doesn't matter. God's salvation is still the same from cover to cover. Um, verse 24, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if, if, there's always the word if, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification that's grace in a nutshell um next i won't be here next sunday but the following sunday after that we're going to look at paul's warning against discord and i want you to mark yourself i want you to watch yourself in the next two weeks on are you argumentative do you envy other people? And because of that envy, you try to 
put down other people and simply because you're envious. Are you a wrathful person? You always think everybody should get what they deserve. Are you a striving person? You always, there's a, there's, you're always looking for a fight. Are you a backbiter? Backstabber, we call it. Are you a whisperer? That is a gossiper. A gossiper. You swell. In other words, I know we all swell. I'm a little swollen today. Do you puff up over who you are? Are you tumultuous? Is there uncleanness? Is there fornication? Is there lasciviousness in your life? These are warnings against discord in the church. And I'm going to deal with them when I get back. Heavenly Father, we ask your word to be blessed. We ask your name to be praised. We ask God that you deal with our hearts concerning our faith, our trust in you. Help us, dear God, to continue to abide in that faith. For therein lies our salvation. Bless and honor your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.